Welcome, Tale Tellers, to the 100th episode. Oh, it's gone by fast. I wanted to do something special, and I've promised to do this for, well, essentially 80 plus episodes. And that is a history, knowledge, and information dive on the Fey Folk. An old request from a long, long time listener of mine that I've promised to do. That's Troy Shaw. He's my second slash third set of ears when it comes to audio, and he always lets me know whether I'm on track or way off with my recordings. And actually, a lot of new fans are doing the same thing, and it's marvelous. So thanks for that. <laughs> so just want to say, Troy, it's finally happened. I wanted to incorporate some other requests, which were HP Lovecraft, werewolves, skinwalkers. In the end, I settled for the Fey, mainly because it's not something a lot of people that I know actually understand or have heard of. I will be doing more on werewolves and the other cryptids like Japanese ghosts. In fact, I might even do a whole week on Japanese ghosts. We'll see. So don't worry, there will be loads on the way. And a special thank you to Arkin Brother for suggesting werewolves. Um, I know you are passionate about these creatures, um, but I will get to them. I've done them before, so I thought I'd try something a little bit different. I'll also be including all my links and sources in the episode description. So if any of you are interested, you can have a read as well. There are a lot um, because I've done a lot of research. But by all means, uh, have a look through them. So let's start off with some shout outs before I jump into our knowledge bank of the Fae. And for those of you who stay till the end, I have a little breakdown on how the channel is going, uh, where it's hopefully heading, and what to expect in the future. So in no order, Troy Shaw, Arkan Brother, The Mad Catter, Sin, Wee Woo Wee Woo, Kyle Brandt, Katie Sturgill, Quasar Bolt, Blackpaw360, More Noir, The Crazy Town Podcast, Nelson Blake, Empty the Podcast, Corey25Lin, and Skeleton Flip are my shoutouts today. Uh, some of you have been supporters since the very beginning, and others just hopped on along the way, and I really appreciate it. So I just wanted to say thank you for supporting me this far, and if I've missed anyone, please let me know. Please. <laughs> and just before we hop in, thank you. As a listener, you may not realize how much help you're giving to this channel. But the fact that you're listening means I'm doing something right. Well, I hope so. The fact that you take the time out of your day to hear this is brilliant, and you'll listen to help authors from all over the world get their stories out there. So a special thank you to you. Okay, let's go. So first, I want to start by taking a look at what the Fey are. The Fey by many are considered as fairies. Creatures that reside in forests, plants, trees, dirt, and even rivers. Now, have you ever heard of elementals before? Maybe? Maybe? Well, they're creatures that are considered a force of nature. I think that term really captures the essence of what elementals are. And in turn, what the Fey are, because to an extent, they're both quite similar. Both of them are embodiments of nature, with a physical slash spiritual presence. Let me explain what an elemental briefly is, and I'll jump right back into the Fey. It'll serve as a really good concept to build the Fey knowledge foundation, as it were, by comparing it to the elementals. So elementals, as mentioned, are a force of nature. So if you can imagine a fire in the ground coming to life, or a river spitting out little water creatures that walk off and do their own thing, and people did believe this happened, albeit a very long time ago. But I wouldn't be surprised if there are some cultures out there still that align themselves to that. So just like the elementals are, where a fire could leap into human form, the same goes with the Fey. Creatures, or sometimes called fairies, that inhabit nature, they are often represented as little winged creatures in our modern era. For example, Tinkerbell from Peter Pan. Now, before the hardcore Cryptozoologist slam dunks me for this representation. Let me continue by saying they are often represented like that. It's not to say that this is their only representation. I'll go into the variety that live in our world around fairies and the Fae. And this is often the first thing people think of when discussing fairies and when they're first introduced to them. And before I go into the large variety of creatures that fall under the Fae, and it's huge, it's absolutely massive. Let's take a look at where it all started. We have to ask ourselves one key question. Is there a point of origin for the Fae? So did it start in any one particular country? Not exactly. 
The earliest record that I could come across was actually Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which was 850 BCE, describing some fairies as dryads and nymphs that were found around the Achilles Springs, simply dancing. Yep, you heard right. That's what fairies do. They dance and have a good time. Another seriously early account of fairies, or as it were first coined, little people, was during the 13th century work of Gervais Tilbury from England. And this is where I noticed a significant branch out around the Fae and how they're categorized. During the earlier period of the discovery of Fae, people had used previous naming conventions and Gervais called them demons. And interestingly, the French called them Neptunes, which is different. I've never heard that before. Gervais identified fairies as no bigger than half an inch or the size of a small finger. Can you imagine just going about your day, seeing this thumb thing rolling around your kitchen? I imagine Gervais just thinking, "Ah, well, looks like I've lost my mind. Better document this in case I'm not actually insane. (laughs) Now keep in mind, this is a English representation or documentation of the earliest fairies. There are fairies from all around the world, but this is the earliest account I could find. So I know it's a bit airy fairy, but let's get into some real details, you know, devils in the details. So um, what do we know about fairies? Well, the more common origins are Celtic, Germanic, and Greco-Roman in nature. And folklorists outline that the belief in fairies stem from the days prior to Christianity, in which the advent of Christianity caused a loss of credibility in fairy folk. And before this, in the 15th century, the fae folk were just considered as being good or evil. No categories. But later on, four key categories came around by an alchemist called Paracelsus. The four are air, earth, fire, and water. But they've got unique names attached to them. Well, the Fey names. Air being sylphs, earth being gnomes, fire being salamanders, and water being undines. And I've never heard that term before, so it's new to me. And all the way from there through to modern day, it's actually the Victoria era that then led artists to create fairies the way that we see them now. The idea is that fairies are cute, tiny creatures with wings. You know, Tinkerbell. Now there is a lot of information out there on the origins of Fae or the Fae folk stories, but there's not a lot of information that I could find about the first account or uh, the iconic historical documentation of um, the fae folk or fairies. I'm sure there is though, somewhere on the web um, or in a journal, but it's probably not in English. Uh, And the reason why I say that is because a lot of the information that I found was uh, from Germany or, uh, you know, Celtic or or Norse background. So a lot of the information actually has been translated for me to be able to be read. I've been quite fortunate. But I won't delve further into the history at this point because I've kind of given you a quick crash course on that. Uh, Let's jump into the more juicy parts, as in what kinds of fae are there? Quick disclaimer, I've picked the common, semi-common, and perhaps slightly unheard of fae slash fairies, so if I've missed any, let me know. Okay, strap yourself in. Let's first cover off the generic general fairy type. So this is basically a 360 perspective of what the typical general winged fairy or spirit fairy is. So the general winged fairy slash spirit fairy is actually deemed often as a legendary creature that fulfills so many roles in our society, culturally and spiritually, that us humans never notice. Also, the more nature aligned uh, fairy or winged fairy is around flowers and trees and the earth. So they say that flowers planted or trees grown or forest expanses have their own set of unique and living fairies. So when your plant dies, those fairies are pissed. So not only do I have a dead plant on my hands, I have a spiritual being that's furious at me. In saying this, winged fairies provide protection or malice. In the story Snow White, and in particular, the Brothers Grimm version in 1812, It shows how many of the fairies are invited to the birth of Snow White, providing her the very talents and skills she has in her life. Now, this is actually coined a fairy birth, with gifts bestowed to a chosen child or special children. 
So in some cases, it could be the daughter of a king. Um, it just depends on the situation. And on the other side of the coin is the malice that these fairies can bring. So if we annoy a fairy or a spirit fairy, uh, they can bestow curses and hexes out of fury and anger. The very curse that would kill, or in this case, put Snow White to sleep. So their magic can be pretty powerful. Let's actually have a look at some more well-known fairies. And as mentioned, the name fairies does cover a wide breadth. So there may be some in here that you might disagree with, and rightfully so. It just depends on how you categorize the fae and fairy folk, because it actually includes things like spirits, goblins, demons, elementals, the undead, and elves. So the list we have here is extensive. For obvious reasons, I've shrunk it down to what I consider the most identifiable. So believe it or not, we can start with the leprechaun, pronounced Leith Brogan or Leith Frogan. And I'm sure I'm ruining these, <laughs> but you'll have to bear with me. And of course, as many of you know, it stems from Irish folklore. The leprechaun was and still is one of the best known male solitary fairy folk. They're mischievous and are known to playing practical jokes upon mortals. They actually dress in a homely style clothing set that looks very, very ordinary and is often a tiny male figure with an old, withered face. He's actually often considered a shoemaker and trades favors for gold, sometimes even wishes. So leprechauns are really, really powerful. And as the saying goes, you'll always find one at the end of a rainbow. And you'll also find their pot of gold. Never touch the gold though. Most of the time it's fool's gold and it's often used to trick us humans. So be careful around those leprechauns. Our next fairy folk is hobgoblins. So their origin is actually Welsh in nature. And the term hob actually means hearth. Ergo, house. And, put two and two together, house goblin. Trace back all the way to 1530s with the first major account where the hobgoblin was spotted. The hobgoblin is a hairy but good-natured sensitive fairy folk. So they basically look and live in a house and essentially shouldn't be bothering humans. They can be a little bit mischievous, but all around, they're quite well mannered. You can annoy them though, and they actually do get quite angry. They are extremely temperamental and are associated with farms and particularly dairies. They are also a relative to the brownie. Now, before I hop into the brownies, um, hobgoblins, the only way to annoy them significantly is to do things like smash plates or move things around or mess around with stuff in your house that's been kept there for years or months because hobgoblins love conformity and a lack of change. So everything keeping constant. As soon as you start messing things around, uh, hobgoblins become temperamental and start being mischievous. So they'll make things go missing or hide your keys, stuff like that. Now brownies, and no, not the ones we eat. Man, I do want to have some brownies. Anyway, so brownies are described as a person of small stature, wrinkly visage, covered with short, curly brown hair, and wearing a brown mantle and hood. They work in houses for small gifts like food, but unlike hobgoblins, brownies are exclusively tied to houses and working in the kitchen. Interesting fact, there's a house on the banks of the River Tay that apparently was believed to have such a creature there. So much so that in the house, there's said to be a room dedicated to the brownie called, uh, go figure, the brownie room. Brownies are considered mischievous and sometimes deemed as evil spirits, which leads me to bogarts because bogarts are brownies with a twist. Bogarts is a term used in English folklore for either a household spirit or a malevolent genius that lives in marshes, fields, forests, and the like. Other names of this group include Bug, Bugger Bear, Bogey, Bogeyman, Boggle, etc. and causes mischief and things to disappear, milk to sour, and dogs to go lame. The Bogart inhabits marshes or holes in the ground and is often attributed to more serious evil doing such as the abduction of children. And I'll get into that later. But Bogarts have no set appearance and size. Many are described as relatively human-like in form, though usually uncouth 
very ugly and often with bestial attributes. So does that mean exceptionally ugly people? I mean seriously, this could just be a really awful dig at ugly people. <sighs> anyway, one such bogart, I quote, was a squat hairy man who was as strong as a six-year-old horse and with arms almost as long as tackle poles. Okay, I risk my case. Clearly, they are taking a dig out of ugly people. I'm just half expecting to be like, There ain't no Bogart. That's me brother Jack. <laughs> well, other accounts give a more completely beast-like form. For example, the Bogart of Lungar Heed from Yorkshire was said to be a fearsome, cow-sized creature with long shaggy hair and eyes like saucers. It trailed a long chain after itself, which made a noise like the baying of hounds. The Bogart of Hackensall Hall in Lancashire had the appearance of a huge horse. At least one Lancashire Bogart could take the form of various animals or indeed more fearful creatures. So these Bogarts are quite powerful and apt at shapeshifting. The Bogarts of Lancashire were said to have a leader or a master called Ode Hob who had the form of a satyr or archetypal devil, typical horns, cloven hooves, and a tail. Bogarts, though, are always evil and actually appear as an omen of death. And the even stranger thing is, they could actually also follow a family even if they run away to another area to avoid them. The creature will just chase right after them. It's said that they crawl into the beds and put their gross, disgusting, clammy hands on people's faces as they sleep just to annoy them. Sometimes they pull bed sheets off or tug on people's ears. Whoa, what a pain in the ass. Aside from that, it doesn't seem so bad, but depending on what folklore you read, it seems there's a varying degree of how dangerous these bogarts are. Now, if however, you hang a horseshoe above the door of your house and leave a pile of salt at the front of your door, it deters the bogarts. It's like Bogart be gone spray. I mean, it's hard to tell as well if they're gone because most of the time they are invisible. So yeah, good luck confirming that. I mean, I guess the dead giveaway is my ears don't hurt anymore and my face is absent of clammy hands. Looks like it's back to sleeping peacefully. <laughs> and these things are by no means small or mild mannered. No, 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 no. Apparently, they've been known to trap people in marshes and bogs, hence the name, and kill people. Yeesh. There is quite a difference between pulling an ear and killing someone in a marsh. Goodness. And one more of the Bogart Brownie family, Boggles. Now, this one is interesting. They bring on a sense of dread and are completely invisible, and perform evil deeds to only murderers and liars. Okay, that's quite specific. Not that I'm complaining though, especially on the murderer part. But as we go away from the Bogarts and the Brownies and Boggles, we venture into the Fey territory of Changelings. And these are rich <laughs> with resources. Uh, there's plenty of information about them. So let's dig in. There are many names for the Changeling in Scottish Gaelic tradition. The Changeling was called Umad, in Irish folklore, it's a Siofra, and the Welsh called them Plentyn. And anyone from those countries <laughs> that heard me say this and just cringed, uh, let me know how to say it, and, <laughs> and I'll be ever grateful. Now, these changelings are extremely dangerous according to folklore. The fairy changeling would secretly exchange a mortal infant with that of their fairy kind. The fairy baby is called a changeling in its own right, but sometimes these stolen babies were actually returned to their families, especially when a person can expose the true nature of the changeling. So what I mean by the fairy baby is the changeling. The changeling will adopt the shape and likeness of a child and imitate the childlike foibles and activities that you would expect your own child to do. Meanwhile, your child is in the fey world. Now this is extremely dangerous, but there is a way to catch them. Now, changelings have a wicked sense of humor and laugh at how strange humans can be, especially if the changeling thinks that what you're doing is ridiculously dumb. 
For example, if you put your hat on a shoe, the baby changeling will laugh hysterically. Or for example, you put butter on your hand and smear it on your face. The changeling might even talk directly to you and ask you why you did that whilst laughing. And in fairness, if I saw someone just get butter, put it on their hand and smear it on their face, I think I'd laugh hysterically as well. But it's during these hysterics that the changeling reveals itself. And when I say reveal itself, it could be as simple as getting up and leaving the room or throwing things, or yelling and screaming in another language, is quite robust in how they reveal themselves once they're caught. Furthermore, these fairy babies were sickly as well. So, you would be able to identify that there's something odd about your child, and you would wonder why your baby is behaving just a bit off. One way to recognize them is to place them on a fire and chant, I wouldn't recommend this to any child because the only alternative is if it's not a changeling baby, uh, it will just catch on fire. So that's kind of insane. Um, But the alternative is if it is a changeling baby, and I think at this point you'd want it to be, it will climb up the chimney and leave. And according to some folklorists, the stolen baby, I kid you not, I quote, is apparently then living in a place of good living, music, and mirth. The danger is when the child eats the food there, or is there long enough to become part of the fey world itself, and as a result, turns into a changeling. So that's pretty freaky. Our next fey creature is the Fuka, mainly a creature of Celtic folklore, considered to be bringers both of good and bad fortune. They could either help or hinder rural and marine communities. The Fuka can be dark or staunch with white fur or hair, And the creatures were also said to be shape changers, which could take the appearance of horses, goats, cats, dogs, and hares. Sometimes even satyr-like. So for those who aren't familiar with satyrs, they are part human and part goat or animal. I thought I'd just clear that up just in case. They may also take human form, which includes various parts of them being animal in nature. So just like I mentioned, similar to a satyr. In Irish folklore, it's considered a goblin. See what I mean by categories and fairies? Yeesh! It's just difficult to pinpoint where one fey folk starts and the other ends. In Irish folklore, they are definitely considered shapeshifters, and I quote, vicious pranksters. Vicious. So I'm going to lean possibly towards even deadly. Fuka can't enter human homes. So similar to vampires, I mean, I know vampires have to be invited, um, but Fukas can't enter homes at all. Whilst the Welsh version of Fukas, called Bukas, are notorious kidnappers who break into human homes. So I think I'd lock my doors with that knowledge in mind, especially if I was in that era. Goodness. Irish Fukas, though, love destroying crops. Apparently. They just love it. If you have any unharvested crops, and the Fuka is around on the time of the Samhain, which is harvest season at the beginning of winter, well, consider yourself rewarded with a dead cow. (laughs) Yep. If you choose to cut crops that are unharvested after the Samhain, well, dead cows for everyone. Ah, what a piece of work. Goodness. Some fey are really, really painful to live with, and the Fuka are no exception. (laughs) So let's drill down into maybe some more specific fey. Now you hardcore cryptozoologists out there, you might be able to be like, oh yes, stories, I know, I know this one off by heart. I know what you're going to say. It's going to be goblin or it's going to be earth spirit. No. Actually, it's called Dullahan. The Dullahan is actually kind of mainstream-ish. So what I mean by that is you probably would have seen a film about it and not known it. Dullahan refers to the headless phantom coachman who drives a black coach known as Coach Aboa or Kois Budha, sometimes drawn by headless horses. Now I draw a tenuous link between uh, the Dullahan and the headless horsemen, but there is definitely a link there. Now in the coach, there is a coffin. Tom and Croft the Crocker, another folklorist, called it the death cart. Dullahan were usually accompanied by the Banshee, which were wailing as if it was a funeral. Sometimes this Banshee is also headless, 
In other traditions, the Dullahan doesn't ride in a coach, but rides a headless horse. So again, not the headless horseman, but in this case, they'd both be headless, the horse and the rider. If a person opened the door when he or she hears a coach rumbling by, that person may have a pitcher full of blood thrown onto their face. That is the mark of death. And disgusting. It seemed that the Dullahan can take off their head at will. So they have their heads on, but they can remove them. The Dullahan may even toss their head around like a gruesome ball game. Those who watch him pass may lose their eye to his whip. According to other folklorists, the cracking of the whip is in itself an omen of death. There are anecdotes of the headless phantom or person scattered throughout older Celtic literature. The best known was Kuroi, a king of Munster who was involved in beheading games with three Ulster's champions in the tale of Fled Brickin from Feast of Brickru. A similar beheading tale is also found in a Middle English poem, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So I thought I would include these in here just in case you wanted to find out more. But I'd never heard of the Dullahan, and I thought this creature was something particularly awesome. <laughs> Our next one is the Banshee. Now I know, Arkan Brother, you're going to particularly like this one. Uh, originally in Irish literature, Banshee actually means Woman of Fairy Mound or just simply as fairy woman. Now, ban or bean means woman. The various spelling and pronunciation of the word for fairy mound referred to the otherworldly realm, which in Irish referred to as she or sidhe. So just to be clear, the way you read this is S-I-D-H-E. Um, so you could read it as sidhe or sidhe. But the way it's actually said is she, I think. Anyone from Ireland, please correct me. So that's a cool little bit of information there. The word Banshee may have originated from East Munster, and there are many ways it can be spelt. In Irish Gaelic, it can be spelt Banshee, so instead of S-H-E-E, it's S-H-I-E. Or even Bean, She, and Ben, Side. But remember, the Irish language pronounces it different. So we spell it B-E-N-S-I-D-E. -E. Uh, they would say it as Bean She. And I mention this because I think it's really interesting around the origins of the word and the creature. And you really get a, a feel of the culture and where it stems from by understanding this. Now going on from that, it was only later Irish and Scottish Gaelic folklore traditions that Banshee came to mean a female wraith or spirit whose screaming is a death omen for the person in the household that hears it. This banshee was tied to a person or family, sort of like an attendant fairy. She only foretells the pending death of a person. Unlike the Breton fairy woman Corrigan, the banshee does not cause a person's death with her power or curse. Now that's really interesting because before this, I actually thought banshees caused death. So when you heard it, that was what killed you. In this case, it's an omen to tell you that your death is imminent, or a family or loved one's death is imminent. That's pretty different to my own understanding of what Banshees were. And as mentioned, these Banshees are accompanied by the Dullahan on certain situations. And there was an account reported in 1807 that one headless Banshee had frightened to death two sentries stationed at James Park. It's just fascinating that these actually get reported as serious crimes or as actual events that took place. Uh, to some people, I mean, even listening now, still may believe in fairies or fey folk. So it's really cool to see how far reaching the fey folk mythos and history goes. It always amazes me. The next fair I want to cover is the Bean Nye. Bean Nye was the Scottish Gaelic name for the washer at the ford. The washer or washerwoman can be found in almost every Celtic culture. Bean Nye is just one of the different forms of the Irish Banshee, a female wraith figure. In the Scottish Gaelic tradition, the washer is the harbinger of death. My goodness. According to the Scottish Gaelic tradition, the Bean Nye was a woman who died at childbirth. She was described as a woman dressed in green, but can be recognized by her webbed feet. The female figure once seen is an omen of death but they would be found at streams or lakes washing bloodstained clothes of those who would die. So if you see a lady washing clothes at a river, 
Just make sure they're not the ones you're wearing. Apparently, it was better for a person to see her first before she sees that person. It was possible for a person to escape his or her doom if the person was brave enough to seize her... Wow. Okay. Stand back, ladies and gentlemen, for this bombshell. If the person was brave enough to seize her breast and suck on it. Goodness. That line of text is one I thought I'd never have to read on this channel. The person was then protected because he or she would become a foster child of this female wraith. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Earlier Irish and Welsh legends of the Washer at the Ford only bore superficial resemblance to the Scottish Bean Nye. The earlier washerwomen in early Irish and Welsh traditions were goddesses, and Bean Nine were probably derived from these figures. So the Irish anecdote of Bean Nine would be the goddess Morgan, and the Welsh goddess Modron. In the Irish myth, Dagda meets a woman washing at the ford of the river near Glen Etten on a Samhain night. Now this woman was beautiful and not a preface to Dagda's doom. Dagda slept with her, and she offered to aid him in the coming battle. Though the name of this woman was not given, she was most likely to be Morrigan. Here, she foretold the defeat of the Fomorians, but that was not only the purpose of Morrigan. Morrigan represented the sovereignty of Ireland. For Ireland to enjoy its wealth and fertility, it required a king to have sex with the sovereignty goddess or lady of Ireland. For Ireland to renew its prosperity and the fertility of the land, Dagda was required to sleep with Morrigan each year on Samhain night. You can search Wedded to the Land in Celtic World, and it covers all of this off. So I know there's a lot of detail in there, and it's referencing a lot of different stories, but those are some kind of more lesser known uh, fey folk, and I thought I'd just cover them off because they're actually really interesting. Okay, so enough on the fairy types for now. Um, I might cover more of those in other episodes, but I want to just jump into how cultures or different cultures categorize and felt about fairies. Our first one is Ireland, which considers fairies in three distinct groups. The first one is fallen angels who do not follow Satan into hell, but choose to reside on earth. The second explains that they are the dead who are not good enough to go into heaven but are too kind and good-natured to enter hell, and instead reside in a limbo world where they recreate their former lives, bound on the earthen plane. And the last one is, fairies as children of Eve, whom she hid from God because they were dirty. As punishment, God cursed her, saying that the children she tried to hide from him would remain hidden from her, and subsequently, all mankind. Now that's really interesting. Their term for fae, derived from fate or fates seen as fairies and supernatural women, who directed lives of men and attended births. Fairies tied to the earth, though, are called ace sid, so remember what I mentioned before, it'd be she, and are fairies that are distinctly tied to the earth. What I found personally really interesting in researching this information, and finding out more about Irish history and culture regarding the fairy folk, is that the Irish apparently did not develop a ghost tradition until the coming of Anglo-Normans, or demonology until the imposition of Roman Catholicism. Until then, their supernatural law centered around fairies. And I found that really, really cool. I, for one, had no idea. If uh, anyone disagrees with that, let me know. I could be on the wrong track. Uh, I could get my facts wrong, but that's what I've found in my research. So I'd love to hear what you all think. Now let's look at the Scottish folklore for fairies. Scottish folklore has the fairies divided into two distinct courts. The Seely Court, that are kind but still dangerous if provoked, and the Unseely Court, which are the very, very dangerous and malicious fairies. You do not want to approach them on any account. Now while the fairies from the Seely Court enjoyed playing pranks on humans, they were usually harmless, compared to the Unseely Court that enjoyed bringing harm to humans as entertainment. Something that you might not know is that Scottish fairy tales talk about trooping fairies, which are fairies who appear in groups and might form settlements. These settlements then go on to grow and increase in size or attack and conquer other settlements. In the Scottish definition, fairies are usually understood in a wider sense 
as the term can also include various kinds of mythical creatures, mainly of Celtic origin. However, the term might also be used for similar beings such as dwarves or elves from Germanic folklore, which are opposed to the solitary fairies who do not live or associate with others of their kind, so like dryads and nymphs. And those two dryads and nymphs are a different creature set altogether, but similar to fairies, because they too inhabit the trees, the plants, the forest. Dryads normally, to my knowledge and research, inhabit trees. They can even inhabit one tree. And nymphs are often seen as elementals that inhabit rivers, um, lakes, ponds. They're more of a water elemental type. Now, Norse mythology called the fairy folk... Oh gosh, I'm going to ruin this. Doklafar and Iljosalfa. So, Old Norse for light elves and dark elves. The two different elves are as you would expect. So the first one mentioned, which is the light elves, dwell within the earth and have leathery, rough skin. And it's written that they are fairer than the sun to look at, while the latter are as dark as night and equally dark-spirited in nature. There isn't too much on them other than the terminology and cross-referencing to elves and fairy folk. So this was difficult to locate. And the Norse also speak of Fien or the Fienen, roughly translating to fair ones. Uh, and then it also references hill people, so just like the Irish folklore, Sidhe or She. In some accounts, it also stretches the wording to also refer to these creatures as Picts. So if some of the sharper cryptozoologist people out there or fans out there, you may be able to stretch that that was where the word Pixie came from. Regarding German tales, the brother Grimm actually had some fairies deemed as undead, Daemons, or demons, that walk the Fey realm that humans cannot see. And I can understand how the Brothers Grimm came to that conclusion, uh, especially when it comes to these creatures being able to pop in and out of our plane, and the way that they interact with us. I can see how they would draw that link. Now moving on from the cultural component, I want to move on to the more common linking traits that these creatures share with each other, and whether or not you should fear them or be kind to them. So are Fae dangerous? Well, I think you can kind of guess the answer to that one. <laughs> but let's have a look at the Fae attributes in general. They do have wild mood swings and can react in crazy ways to the smallest of acts, both in a positive and negative way, giving amazing rewards for small acts of kindness while doling out an equally crazy punishment for a small offense. The Fae are heavily rule-driven, stricken to rules and taboos that can sometimes conflict with human nature, and often don't mesh with our rules and regulations. If we're talking about Scottish law where there are two courts, the Unseelie and Seelie, uh, it's really easy to identify which ones you want to <laughs> interact with. The Seelie court can be dangerous if offended, they can be. But the primary difference between these two groups is that the Unseelie court is never under any circumstances, favorable to humans. Ever. So should you ever encounter them, well, run. They will only harm, trick, or kill you. Now there's no clear indicator of how to identify a silly from an unsilly, other than them actually telling you up front, and they often will, because they are often proud of what they represent. Aside from Scottish law, the Fae can be kind and are capable of gratitude. They readily reward any kindness done to them, no matter how small, and they can show gratitude through some amazing ways. For example, typical rewards include gifts of food or magical supplies of grain and flour that never end. Constant good health and fortune, or even being saved from danger, or even death. So yeah, they possess great strength. And you can expect good fairies to be helpful and fair, to return stuff they borrow, to support true love, to enjoy music and dancing, and to keep things neat and tidy and in order. And they have a keen admiration for beauty. In saying that, if you do anything to disrupt this, that's when the fairy folk or fae folk like brownies and bogarts really play up. Fairies also don't care about human objects. I mean, not even remotely. And they seem to believe they are entitled to take whatever they need. The fairy adage is, all that's yours is mine, and all that's mine is my own. They don't just steal objects. They kidnap cows, horses, and all sorts of small beasts. So, in other words, fairies are full of double standards. 
And here are some definitely negative aspects to fairies. Do not steal from them. Fairies become furious if humans steal from them. They won't just be playing tricks on you if they find out that you're the person that took it. And if a prank backfires or the joke is on them, they do not take it well. Trust me, it's double standards galore with fairies. Never trust the fae. They keep to their word, but it's often twisted. So keep your wits about you. Never enter the fae world. This is a big one. If you are invited into the fae or to enter the fae plane, you will know from the haze and the mist that humans see. The fae don't see that because they can see with clarity. The biggest caution I can give you from my own research is do not eat there, okay? If you eat there, you will never, ever leave. Once their food touches your lips, you're their property. That's it. You're stuck in the Fey plane. There have been stories, though, of magical items promised by the Fey where those rewards are tucked away in the plane world. Now, once given to them, they put it on, whether it be a pair of boots or a jacket, and it whisks them away from our world into the Fey world, never to be seen again. But there is some level of countermeasure here. Lastly on this list is carry a mirror. Whenever you enter a forest and you think there may be fae around, use the mirror to identify illusions versus reality. Some fae are illusionary and won't appear visible in the mirror, and thus cannot directly harm you. If they appear there though, and it happens to be a bogart or a changeling, definitely be careful. Hell, even just run. It is totally not worth the risk. And this concludes the 100th episode. And before I end this episode, I'll just talk about the channel and the future of the channel briefly. So for those of you that have been with me from the very beginning, the long haul, the big slug, thank you so much. Seriously, it's been an absolute pleasure narrating these and it's only going to continue to get better. This channel goes from leaps and bounds with your support. The fact that you're listening, the fact that I have listeners here right now, is helping this channel grow, which is helping authors get their stories out there and growing the community. So a special thank you to the listeners. And I can tell people are sharing this podcast around. The numbers do not lie. So thank you so much. It really means a lot to me. So I've been asked, is anything changing right now? No. I'm going to continue narrating stories and will be focusing on improving the audio, sound effects, and loads more. What are my plans for the future of this channel? Well, I'm going to try and do more collaborations, work with different narrators, and see how far that goes. In fact, I have one piece that I've just finished with another narrator, whose name is Skinned Locus. It's a cool name. And it's a skinwalker story. Go figure. So yes, lots more collaborations in the future. And he's just uploaded it as well today. So I might as well link it in the episode description. Well, the future is bright, you awesome tale tellers, and I only have you to thank. Stay tuned for the next 100 episodes or more, and join me on this journey of fantastic stories. And as always, creepy fans, have yourself a great night, a great day or evening, and if you encounter the Fae, well, you're well prepared to know what you're facing. Thank you all so much. <laughs>